Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today is our five year anniversary. Happy anniversary. And I have for you in the background a pirate ship on the ocean. Now, close your eyes, lay back, and let me read you to sleep. And now, on with our story time. Manuscript found in the coast of Yucatan. On August 20th, 1917, I, Carl Heinrich, Graf von Altberg, Ehrenstein, Lieutenant Commander in the Imperial German Navy and in charge of the submarine U-29, deposit this bottle and record in the Atlantic Ocean at a point to me unknown, but probably about north latitude 20 degrees, west longitude 35 degrees, where my ship lies disabled on the ocean floor. I do so because of my desire to set certain unusual facts before the public, a thing I shall not in all probability survive to accomplish in person sense. The circumstances surrounding me are as menacing as they are extraordinary, and they involve not only the hopeless crippling of the U-29, but the impairment of my iron German will in a manner most disastrous. On the afternoon of June 18th, as reported by wireless to the U-61 bound for Gell, we torpedoed the British freighter Victory, New York, to Liverpool in north latitude 45 degrees 16 minutes, west longitude 28 degrees 34 minutes, permitting the crew to leave in boats in order to obtain a good cinema view for the Admiralty records. The ship sank quite picturesquely, bow first, the stem rising high out of the water whilst the hole shot down perpendicularly to the bottom of the sea. Our camera missed nothing, and I regret that so fine a reel of film should never reach Berlin. After that, we sank the lifeboats with our guns and submerged. When we rose to the surface about sunset, a seaman's body was found on the deck, hands gripping the railings in a curious fashion. The poor fellow was young, dark, and very handsome, probably Italian or Greek, and undoubtedly of the Victory's crew. He had evidently sought refuge on the very ship which had been forced to destroy his own. One more victim of the unjust war of aggression which the English are waging upon the fatherland. Our men searched him for souvenirs and found in his coat pocket a very odd bit of ivory, carved to represent a youth's head crowned with laurel. My fellow officer, Lieutenant Kienz, believed that the thing was of great age and artistic value, so took it from the man for himself. How it had ever come into the possession of a common sailor, neither he nor I could imagine. As the dead man was thrown overboard, there occurred two incidents which created much disturbance amongst the crew. The fellow's eyes had been closed, but in the dragging of his body to the rail, they were jarred open, and many seemed to entertain a strange delusion that they gazed steadily and mockingly at Schmidt and Zimmer, who were bent over the corpse. The boatswain Muller, an elderly man, who should have known better had he not been highly superstitious, became so excited by this impression that he watched the body in the water, and he swore that after it sank a little, it drew its limbs into a swimming position and sped away to the south, under the waves. Kians and I did not like these displays of peasant ignorance, and we severely reprimanded the men, particularly Muller. The very next day, 
A very troublesome situation was created by the indisposition of some of the crew. They were evidently suffering from nervous strain from our long voyage, and they had had bad dreams. Several seemed quite dazed and stupid, and after satisfying myself that they were not feigning their weakness, I excused them from their duties. The sea was rather rough, so we descended to a depth where the waves were less troublesome. Here we were comparatively calm, despite a somewhat puzzling southward current, which we could not identify from our oceanographic charts. The moans of the sick men were decidedly annoying, but since they did not appear to demoralize the rest of the crew, we did not resort to extreme measures. It was our plan to remain where we were and intercept the linear dossier mentioned in information from agents in New York. In the early evening, we rose to the surface and found the sea less heavy. The smoke of a battleship was on the northern horizon, but our distance and ability to submerge made us safe. What worried us more was the talk of Boatswain Muller, which grew wilder as night came on. He was in a detestably childish state, and baffled of some illusion of dead bodies drifting past the undersea portholes, bodies which looked to him intensely, and which he recognized in spite of bloating as having seen dying during some of our victorious German exploits. And he said that the young man we had found and tossed overboard was their leader. This was very gruesome and abnormal, so we confined Muller in irons and had him soundly whipped. The men were not pleased at his punishment, but discipline was necessary. We also denied the request of a delegation headed by Seaman Zimmer, that the curious carved ivory head be cast into the sea. On June 20th, Seaman Bohin and Schmidt, who had been ill the day before, became violently insane. I regretted that no physician was included in our complement of officers, since German lives are precious but the constant ravings of the two concerning a terrible curse were most subversive of discipline, and so drastic steps were taken. The crew accepted the event in a sullen fashion, but it seemed to quiet Muller, who thereafter gave us no trouble. In the evening, we released him, and he went about his duties silently. In the week that followed, we were all very nervous watching for the dossier. The tension was aggravated by the disappearance of Muller and Zimmer, who undoubtedly committed suicide as a result of the fears which had seemed to harass them. Though they were not observed in the act of actually jumping overboard, I was rather glad to be rid of Muller, for even his silence had unfavorably affected the crew. Everyone seemed inclined to be silent now as though holding a secret fear. Many were ill, but none made a disturbance. Lieutenant Kienz chafed under the strain and was annoyed by the merest trifle, such as the school of dolphins which gathered about the U-29 in increasing numbers and the growing intensity of that southward current, which was not on our chart. It at length became apparent that we had missed the dossier altogether. Such failures are not uncommon, and we were more pleased than disappointed, since our return to Wilhelmshaven was now in order. At noon, June 28th, we turned northeastward, and, despite some rather comical entanglements with the unusual masses of dolphins, we were soon underway. The explosion in the engine room at 2 a.m., was wholly a surprise. No defect in the machinery or carelessness in the men had been noticed. Yet without warning, the ship was racked from end to end with a colossal shock. Lieutenant Kienz hurried to the engine room, finding the fuel tank and most of the mechanism shattered. Engineers Rob and Schneider were instantly killed. Our situation had suddenly become grave indeed. 
For though the chemical air regenerators were intact, and though we could use the devices for raising and submerging the ship, and opening the hatches as long as compressed air and storage batteries might hold out, we were powerless to propel or guide the submarine. To seek rescue in the lifeboats would be to deliver ourselves into the hands of enemies unreasonably embittered against our great German nation. And our wireless had failed ever since the victory affair, meaning no more contact with a fellow U-boat of the Imperial Navy. From the hour of the accident until July 2nd, we drifted constantly to the south, almost without plans, encountering no other vessels. Dolphins still encircled the U-29, a somewhat remarkable circumstance considering the distance we had covered. On the morning of July 2nd, we sighted a warship flying American colors, and the men became very restless in their desire to surrender. Finally, Lieutenant Menz had to shoot a seaman named Traub, who urged this un-German act with a special violence. This quieted the crew for a time, and we submerged unseen. The next afternoon, a dense flock of seabirds appeared from the south, and the ocean began to heave ominously. Closing our hatches, we awaited developments until we realized that we must either submerge or be swamped in the mounting waves. Our air pressure and electricity were diminishing, and we wished to avoid all unnecessary use of our slender mechanical resources. But in this case, there was no choice. We did not descend far, and when, after several hours, the sea was calmer, we decided to return to the surface. Here, however, a new trouble developed, for the ship failed to respond to our direction, in spite of all that the mechanics could do. As the men grew more frightened at this undersea imprisonment, some of them began to mutter again about Lieutenant Ken's ivory image. The sight of an automatic pistol calmed them. We kept the poor devils as busy as we could, tinkering at the machinery, even when we knew it was useless. Kins and I usually slept at different times, and it was during my sleep about 5 a.m. on July 4th that the general mutiny broke loose. The six remaining pigs of seamen, suspecting that we were lost, had suddenly burst into a mad fury at our refusal to surrender, and were in delirium of cursing and destruction. They roared like the animals they were, and broke instruments and furniture indiscriminately, screaming about such nonsense as the curse of the ivory image and the dead youth who looked at them and swam away. Lieutenant Kens seemed paralyzed and inefficient. I shot all six men for it was necessary, and made sure that none remained alive. We expelled the bodies through the double hatches and were alone in the U-29. Kian seemed very nervous and drank heavily. It was decided that we remain alive as long as possible, using the large stock of provisions and chemical supply of oxygen, none of which had suffered from the crazy antics of those swine, hound, seamen. Our compasses, depth gauges, and other delicate instruments were ruined, so that, henceforth, our only reckoning would be guesswork, based on our watches, the calendar, and our apparent drift, as judged by any objects we might spy through the portholes, or from the conning tower. Fortunately, we had storage batteries still capable of long use, both for interior lighting and for the searchlight. We often cast a beam around the ship, but saw only dolphins, swimming parallel to our own drifting course. I was scientifically interested in those dolphins, for, though the ordinary Delphinus delphis is a cetacean mammal, unable to subsist without air, I watched one of the swimmers closely for two hours, and I never saw him alter his submerged condition. With the passage of time, Kins and I decided that we were still drifting south, meanwhile sinking deeper and deeper. We noted the marine fauna and flora, 
and read as much on the subject in the books I had carried with me for spare moments. I could not help observing, however, the inferior scientific knowledge of my companion. His mind was given to imaginings and speculations which have no value. The fact of our coming death affected him curiously, and he would frequently pray in remorse over the men, women, and children he had sent to the bottom, forgetting that all things are considered noble when we're serving. After a time, he became noticeably unbalanced, gazing for hours at his ivory image and weaving fanciful stories of the lost and forgotten things under the sea. Sometimes, as a psychological experiment, I would lead him on in the wanderings and listen to his endless poetical quotations and tales of sunken ships. I was very sorry for him, for I disliked to see a man suffer, but he was not a good man to die with. For myself, I was proud, knowing how the fatherland would revere my memory, and how my sons would be taught to be men like me. On August 9th, we spied the ocean floor and sent a powerful beam from the searchlight over it. It was a vast, undulating plain, mostly covered with seaweed and strewn with the shells of small mollusks. Here and there were slimy objects of puzzling contour, draped with weeds and encrusted with barnacles, which Kins declared must be ancient ships lying in their graves. He was puzzled by one thing, a pink of solid matter, protruding above the ocean bed nearly four feet at its apex, about two feet thick, flat sides and smooth upper surfaces, which met at a very obtuse angle. I called the peak a bit of outcropping rock, but Kins thought he saw carvings on it. After a while, he began to shudder, and turned away from the scene as if frightened. Yet, he could give no explanation save that he was overcome with the vastness, darkness, remoteness, antiquity, and mystery of the oceanic abysses. His mind was tired, but I am always a man, and was quick to notice two things, that the U-29 was standing in the deep sea pressure splendidly, and that the peculiar dolphins were still about us, even at a depth where the existence of high organisms is considered impossible by most naturalists. That I had previously overestimated our depth, I was sure. But nonetheless, we must still have been deep enough to make these phenomena remarkable. Our southward speed, as gauged by the ocean floor, was about as I had estimated from the organisms passed at higher levels. It was at 3.15 p.m., August 12th, that poor Kienz was wholly mad. He had been in the conning tower, using the searchlight, when I saw him bound into the library compartment where I sat reading. His face at once betrayed him. I will repeat here what he said, underlining the words he emphasized. He is calling. He is calling. I hear him. We must go. As he spoke, he took the ivory image from the table, pocketed it, and seized my arm in an effort to drag me up the companionway to the deck. In a moment, I understood that he meant to open the hatch and plunge me into the water outside, a vagary of suicidal and homicidal mania for which I was scarcely prepared. As I hung back and attempted to soothe him, he grew more violent, saying, Come now. Do not wait until later. It is better to repent and be forgiven than to defy and to be condemned. Then I tried the opposite of the soothing plan and told him he was mad, pitifully demented, and he was unmoved, and he cried, If I am mad, it is mercy. May the gods pity the man who in his callousness can remain sane to the hideous end. Come and be mad, whilst he still calls with mercy. This outburst seemed to relieve a pressure in his brain, for as he finished, he grew much milder, asking me to let him depart alone if I would not accompany him. 
my course at once became clear. He was a German, but a commoner, and he was now a potentially dangerous madman. By complying with his suicidal request, I could immediately free myself from one who was no longer a companion, but a menace. I asked him to give me the ivory image before he went. But this request brought from him such uncanny laughter that I did not repeat it. Then I asked him if he wished to leave any keepsake or lava pair for his family in case I should be rescued. But again, he gave me that strange laugh. So as he climbed the ladder, I went to the levers and, allowing proper time intervals, operated the machinery which sent him to his death. After I saw that he was no longer in the boat, I threw the searchlight around the water in an effort to obtain a last glimpse of him. I wished to ascertain whether the water pressure would flatten him as it theoretically should, whether the body would be unaffected, like those extraordinary dolphins. I did not, however, succeed in finding my late companion, for the dolphins were masked thickly and obscuringly about the conning tower. That evening, I regretted that I had not taken the ivory image from poor Kansas' pocket to left, for the memory of it fascinated me. I could not forget the youthful, beautiful head with its leafy crown, though I am not by nature an artist. I was also sorry that I had no one with whom to converse. Kians, though not my mental equal, was much better than no one. I did not sleep well that night and wondered exactly when the end would come. Surely, I had little chance of a rescue. The next day, I ascended to the conning tower and commenced the customary searchlight explorations. Northward, the view was much the same as it had been all the four days since we had sighted the bottom. But I perceived that the drifting of the U-29 was less rapid. As I swung the beam around to the south, I noticed that the ocean floor ahead fell away in a marked declivity, and bore curiously regular blocks of stone in certain places, disposed as if in accordance with definite patterns. The boat did not at once descend to match the greater ocean depth, so I was soon forced to adjust the searchlight to cast a sharply downward beam. Owing to the abruptness of the change, a wire was disconnected, which necessitated a delay of many minutes for repairs. But at length, the light streamed on again, flooding the marine valley below me. I am not given to a motion of any kind, but my amazement was very great when I saw what lay revealed in that electrical glow. And yet, as one reared in the best culture of Prussia, I should not have been amazed, for geology and tradition alike tell us of great transpositions in oceanic and continental areas. What I saw was an extended and elaborate array of ruined edifices, all of magnificent, though, unclassified architecture, and in various stages of preservation. Most appeared to be of marble, gleaming whitely in the rays of the searchlight, and the general plan was of a large city at the bottom of a narrow valley, with numerous isolated temples and vias on the steep slopes above. Roofs were fallen, and columns were broken, but there still remained an air of ancient splendor which nothing could efface. Confronted at last with the Atlantis I had formerly deemed largely a myth, I was the most eager of explorers. At the bottom of that valley, a river once flowed, for as I examined the scene more closely, I beheld the remains of stone and marble bridges and sea walls and terraces and embankments once verdant and beautiful. In my enthusiasm, I became nearly as idiotic and sentimental as poor Kian's, and was very tardy in noticing that the southward current had ceased at last, allowing the U-29 to settle slowly down upon a sunken city, as an airplane settles upon a town of the upper earth. 
I was slow, too, in realizing that the school of unusual dolphins had vanished. In about two hours, the boat rested in a paved plaza close to the rocky wall of the valley. On one side, I could view the entire city as it sloped from the plaza down to the old riverbanks. On the other side, in startling proximity, I was confronted by the richly ornate and perfectly preserved facade of a great building, evidently a temple, hollowed from the solid rock of the original workmanship of this titanic thing, I can only make conjectures. The facade of immense magnitude apparently covers a continuous hollow recess, for its windows are many and widely distributed. In the center yawns a great open door, reached by an impressive flight of steps, and surrounded by exquisite carvings, like the figures of Bucknalls in relief. Foremost of all are the great columns and frays, both decorated with sculptures of inexpressible beauty, obviously portraying idealized pastoral scenes and processions of priests and priestesses bearing strange ceremonial devices in adoration of a radiant god. The art is of the most phenomenal perfection, largely Hellenic in idea, yet strangely individual. It imparts an impression of terrible antiquity, as though it were the remotest rather than the immediate ancestor of Greek art. Nor can I doubt that every detail of this massive product was fashioned from the virgin hillside rock of our planet. It is palpably a part of the valley wall, though how the vast interior was ever excavated I cannot imagine. Perhaps a cavern or series of caverns furnished the nucleus. Neither age nor submersion had corroded the pristine grandeur of this awful fame. For fame indeed it must be. And today, after thousands of years, it rests untarnished and inviolate in the endless night and silence of an ocean chasm. I cannot reckon the number of hours I spent in gazing at the sunken city with its buildings, arches, statues, and bridges, and the colossal temple with its beauty and mystery. Though I knew that death was near, my curiosity was consuming, and I threw the searchlight beam about an eager quest. The shaft of light permitted me to learn many details, but refused to show anything within the gaping door of the rock-hewn temple. And after a time, I turned off the current, conscious of the need of conserving power. The rays were now perceptibly dinner than they had been during the weeks of drifting, and as if sharpened by the coming deprivation of light, my desire to explore the watery secrets grew. I, a German, should be the first to tread those eon-forgotten ways. I produced and examined a deep-sea diving suit of jointed metal, and I experimented with the portable light and air regenerator. Though I should have had trouble in managing the double hatches alone, I believed I could overcome all obstacles with my scientific skill and actually walk about the dead city in person. On August 16th, I effected an exit from the U-29 and laboriously made my way through the ruined and mud-choked streets to the ancient river. I found no skeletons or other human remains, but gleaned a wealth of archaeological lore from sculptures and coins. Of this, I cannot now speak save to utter my awe at a culture in the full noon of glory, when cave-dwellers roamed Europe and the Nile flowed unwatched to the sea. Others, guided by this manuscript, if it shall ever be found, must unfold the mysteries at which I can only hint. I returned to the boat as my electric batteries grew feeble, resolved to explore the rock temple on the following day. On the 17th, as my impulse to search out the mystery of the temple waxed still more insistent, a great disappointment befell for me. 
for I found that the materials needed to replenish the portable light had perished in the mutiny of those pigs in July. My rage was unbounded, yet my sense forbade me to venture unprepared into an utterly black interior, which might prove the lair of some indescribable marine monster or a labyrinth of passages from whose windings I could never extricate myself. All I could do was turn on the waning searchlight of the U-29 and with its aid walk up the temple steps and study the exterior carvings. The shaft of light entered the door at an upward angle and I peered in to see if I could glimpse anything, but all in vain. Not even the roof was visible. And though I took a step or two inside after testing the floor with the staff, I dared not go farther. Moreover, for the first time in my life, I experienced the emotion of dread. I began to realize how some of poor Kansas's moods had arisen. For as the temple drew me more and more, I feared its aqueous abysses with a blind and mounting terror. Returning to the submarine, I turned up the lights and sat, thinking in the dark. Electricity must now be saved for emergencies. Saturday the 18th, I spent in total darkness, tormented by thoughts and memories that threatened to overcome my will. Cairns had gone mad and perished before reaching the sinister remnant of a past unwholesomely remote, and had advised me to go with him. Was, indeed, fate preserving my reason, only to draw me irresistibly to an end more horrible and unthinkable than any man has dreamed of. Clearly, my nerves were sorely taxed, and I must cast off these impressions of weaker men. I could not sleep Saturday night, and turned on the lights regardless of the future. It was annoying that the electricity should not last out the air and provisions. I revived my thoughts of euthanasia, and examined my automatic pistol. Toward morning, I must have dropped asleep with the lights on, for I awoke in darkness yesterday afternoon to find the batteries dead. I struck several matches in succession, and desperately regretted the improvidence which had caused us so long ago to use up the few candles we carried. After the fading of the last match I dared to waste, I sat very quietly, without a light. As I considered the inevitable end, my mind ran over preceding events and developed a hitherto dormant impression which would have caused a weaker and more superstitious man to shudder. The head of the radiant god in the sculptures on the rock temple is the same as that carven bit of ivory which the dead sailor brought from the sea, and that which poor Kien's carried back into that sea. I was a little dazed by this coincidence, but did not become terrified. It is only the inferior thinker who hastens to explain the singular and the complex by the primitive shortcut of supernaturalism. The confidence is strange, but I was too sound a reasoner to connect circumstances which admit of no logical connection, or to associate in any uncanny fashion the disastrous events which led from the victory affair to my present plight. Feeling the need of more rest, I took a sedative and secured some sleep. My nervous condition was reflected in my dreams, for I seemed to hear the cries of drowning persons and to see dead faces pressing against the portholes of the boat. And among the dead faces, was the living, mocking face of the youth with the ivory image. I must be careful how I record my awakening today, for I am unstrung, and much hallucination is necessarily mixed up with fact. Psychologically, my case is most interesting, and I regret that it cannot be observed scientifically by a competent authority. Upon opening my eyes, first sensation was an overmastering desire to visit the rock temple, a desire which grew every instant, 
yet which I automatically sought to resist through some emotion of fear, which operated in the reverse direction. Next there came to me the impression of light amidst the darkness of dead batteries, and I seemed to see a sort of phosphorescent glow in the water through the porthole, which opened toward the temple. This aroused my curiosity, for I knew of no deep-sea organism capable of emitting such luminosity. But before I could investigate, there came a third impression, which, because of its irrationality, caused me to doubt the objectivity of anything my senses might record. It was an oral illusion, a sensation of rhythmic, melodic sound, as of some wild yet beautiful chant or choral hymn, coming from the outside through the absurdly soundproof hull of the U-29. Convinced of my psychological and nervous abnormality, I lighted some matches and poured a stiff dose of sodium bromide solution, which seemed to calm me to the extent of dispelling the illusion of sound. But the phosphorescence remained, and I had difficulty in repressing a childhood impulse to go to the portal and seek its source. It was horribly realistic, and I could soon distinguish by its aid the familiar objects around me, as well as the empty sodium bromide glass of which I had no former visual impression in its present location. This last circumstance made me ponder, and I crossed the room and touched the glass. It was indeed in the place where I had seemed to see it. Now I knew that the light was either real or part of a hallucination so fixed and consistent that I could not hope to dispel it. So abandoning all resistance, I ascended to the conning tower to look for the luminous agency. Might it not actually be another U-boat, offering possibilities of rescue? It is well that the reader accept nothing which follows an objective truth, for since the events transcend natural law, they are necessarily the subjective and unreal creations of my overtaxed mind. When I attained the conning tower, I found the sea in general far less luminous than I had expected. There was no animal or vegetable phosphorescence about, and the city that sloped down to the river was invisible in blackness. What I did see was not spectacular, not grotesque or terrifying, yet it removed my last vestige of trust in my consciousness. For the door and windows of the undersea temple hewn from the rocky hill were vividly aglow with flickering radiance, as from a mighty altar flame far within. Later incidents are chaotic. As I stared at the uncannily lighted doors and windows, I became subject to the most extravagant visions. Visions so extravagant that I cannot even relate them. I fancied that I discerned objects in the temple, objects both stationary and moving, and seemed to hear again the unreal chant that had floated to me when I first awaked, and over all rose thoughts and fears, all of which centered on the youth from the sea and the ivory image whose carving was duplicated in the columns of the temple before me. I thought of poor Kians, and wondered where his body rested with the image he had carried back into this sea. He had warned me of something, and I had not heeded. He was a soft-headed man, who went mad at troubles I could bear with ease. The rest is very simple. My impulse to visit and enter the temple has now become an inexplicable and imperious command, which ultimately cannot be denied. My own will will no longer control my act, and my volition is henceforward possible only in minor matters. Such madness it was that drove Kians to his death, there headed and unprotected in the ocean. But I am a man of sense, and I will use to the last what little will I have. When first I saw that I must go, I prepared my diving suit, helmet, and air regenerator for an instant dawning, and I immediately commenced to write this hurried chronicle in the hope that it may someday reach the world. 
I shall seal the manuscript in a bottle and entrust it to the sea as I leave the U-29 forever. I have no fear, not even from the prophecies of the madman Kians. What I have seen cannot be true, and I know that this madness of my own will at most lead only to suffocation when my air is gone. The light in the temple is a sheer delusion, and I shall die calmly like a man, in the black and forgotten depths. This demonic laughter which I hear as I write comes only from my weakening brain. So I will carefully don my suit and walk boldly up the steps into the primal shrine, that secret of unfathomed waters and uncounted years. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.